Welcome to this episode of Scholars in Conversation. My name is Georg Ganger. I am the coordinator of the Center for Philosophical Studies of History at the University of Oulu, from where we also record this interview today. And I will be today's interviewer. Now, um, today's guest and interviewee is Avies Ataka. I won't be saying much about him right now in terms of introduction, because we'll have a lot of time to talk about his career and his works in, in detail. Um, and I also think um, anybody who knows a bit about the field of the philosophy of history and the philosophy of historiography will know of Avieza and will know of his work now, um, because he's one of the most famous, I suppose, um, living philosophers of history, historiography. Um, and then let me just hit, uh, give you two of his most famous publications here in the beginning, and let me give you one, one bit of information before we start. Now, um, these two publications of him I have here with me. One is um, Our Knowledge of the Past, A Philosophy of Historiography, which is, I guess, um, the most seminal of Avieza's works, where he outlines his own understanding of the philosophy of historiography. And the other is um, a, a book he edited, A Companion to the Philosophy of History and Historiography, which most of you perhaps also know, which is, gives a great overview about philosophical issues concerning history, historiography, but also other historical sciences. And now the uh, piece of information I would like to share with you is that next to Harvard University, um, Avieza now also uh, works at the University of Ostrava in the Czech Republic, where he leads together with David Czerny the newly founded uh, Center for the Philosophy of Historiography, um, which I think you should really check out if you haven't um, done so yet. Okay, um, thank you very much, Avi, for being here. Um, we usually start our interviews with a biographical questions about how you entered our, how people came into our little field. So I know that you um, did your PhD in the late 80s in the US in the philosophy of history. So maybe you can, we can begin by you telling us how you got interested in the field and how you ended up in the US then doing your PhD on it. Well, in the beginning there was history. Uh, when other kids were reading fairy tales, I was reading history books. Uh, I got my first history book when I was five, Illustrated History of the World. And I still remember how it started with the modern era with Charles V. Uh, abdicating and moving to a monastery, and uh, it really impressed me that King gives up. Uh, all those books were written by French people, actually. It was translated from French. So when I was six, I was given uh, a psychological test, uh, mostly for intelligence, but uh, the psychologist also asked me to draw a boy, draw a girl, and draw anything I want. So I drew a boy, I drew a girl, and I drew Napoleon because I was so much under the influence of these French history books that I really thought Napoleon was a, was a, a hero. And then the psychologist says, uh, I think I would like to speak with your mother. Um, and, and so it went. Um, the other influence, why history was so important for me, because when I was a toddler, my mother was doing her first degree in history. So she was really telling me history stories rather than uh, fairy tales. And my grandmother would take care of me while my mother was working. And my grandmother went through the Russian Revolution, the First World War, uh, a lot of European history. So uh, she was also talking about, uh, so it's almost part of my imagination. So I went on reading history mostly until I was uh, 12, 13. Then I discovered science fiction. And when I was 13, I read Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. And the Foundation Trilogy really raises some of the basic assumptions of philosophy of historiography, uh, or philosophy of history. Are the, do laws um, uh, govern history? Does uh, history have a direction? Can it be engineered? It's really treating from a San Simonian perspective. And I was really impressed by it, and I was I started thinking and applying those questions to all this body of historical knowledge that I already acquired. And then when I was 15, I wrote a couple of papers about this. And I showed them to my history teacher in, in high school. His name was Shimon O'Hara. Uh, quite a combination. He was colloquially known as Cactus because of his idiosyncratic hairstyle. And he read it and he was originally, he came from a kibbutz originally. Uh, and he told me, 
this is not history, this is philosophy of history. Have you read Karl Marx? <laughs> um, and I said, no, I haven't read Karl Marx. Uh, but then I went to a bookshop and asked, do you have a book about philosophy of history? By that time I was about 16. And there was one book, Introduction to Philosophy of History, that was written by Leo Rauch. Uh, I've heard of it. He, he was teaching in a small college outside of Boston. Uh, I think he died in 96. Uh, and I still met him uh, in 92. And I told him that when I was in high school, I read his introduction to philosophy of history. I think he was a bit offended uh, <laughs> that somebody from high school sort of thought this, his book was appropriate. But, you know, I was a precocious high schooler, so I, I don't think he should have been offended. And, and that was just a chapter. Each, it was a historical introduction. So it was, you know, from St. Augustine to Collingwood and everybody in between. And uh, uh, so that raised those questions for me. Then when I was, when I went to, to university, I did my BA was indeed in history with some courses in, in philosophy. And there are people who were working on philosophy of history was, were Amos Funkenstein and uh, uh, Yossi Mali, who's still with us. Uh, and uh, I wanted to become a philosopher. I decided that's what I would really want to do because I was spending all the time in the library in the 901 Dewey classification, that's the philosophy of history. I was reading through uh, history and theory uh, and so on. And it was, there was no clear idea for me how to, uh, how to proceed. Uh, in Israel, where I grew up, Nathan Rotenstreich was still alive, but was already semi-retired. And anyway, his approach was not mine. Uh, so what I did is I wrote a letter uh, in 1987 uh, to Richard Van was at that time the editor of History and Theory, and I told him, I am an undergraduate and I really want to, be, do, a philosophy of his, to do philosophy of history, uh, where should I study, and so on. And surprisingly enough, Van actually answered me. <laughs> uh, the first sentence was correct. He said, there is no such program that, where you can uh, study philosophy of, of uh, history. Uh, and then he said, so you might as well apply for some department that has somebody working on that field. And then he made a few suggestions. In the American context, that's not a very good advice, because you don't work with an individual, you work with a department, and then you are valued later according to the prestige of the department, not according to whatever you did. So uh, uh, that's not really good. And, and I get these letters every once in a while, every few years from somebody writing a similar letter to the one I wrote in 87, and I always tell them the best place to, for you to go is one of the most prestigious, you know, go to Princeton in history or Harvard uh, in, in philosophy, don't, and, and just get a general introduction to and do what you want later. Uh, you, don't, you don't rely on a single person. I ended up, uh, because uh, uh, I had no money and I had no right to work, I mean, I was just, uh, and I didn't know what was going on. So uh, the only department that, that Van recommended that could have helped me in that was Columbia. Danto was there, uh, I applied, they accepted me, but they didn't give me any financial help. At the time, I didn't understand at that time, Danto was so marginalized in Colombia that just the very fact that I applied to work with him, obviously, uh, was, a, was a serious <laughs> drawback. Uh, I took it personally, but then I got the financial offer from the University of Maryland, uh, which is in a suburb of Washington. It was an interesting place to be at that time. So I went to Maryland to work with Raymond Martin. Uh, the advantage of, of being in Maryland was that there was really nobody very good there. They were all very mediocre. And, and the advantage in that is that it allowed me to be entirely original, because there was no kind of charismatic, brilliant professor that, that surrounded by a bevy of young graduate students who want to imitate their work and then they're not very original. I never had that temptation because there was nobody so bright there. Uh, so I was able to be entirely original. Martin did not know much about history. Uh, he tried to apply. That. That's a problem in our field is that people are trying to just take models from somewhere else and apply them, and they do it very insensitively when they don't know what's going on uh, in historiography. And it comes out not quite fitting the subject matter. So Martin's assumption was that uh, the model of best among competing explanations uh, would be borrowed from philosophy of science. And what historians are actually doing, they are all trying to explain, let's say, the French Revolution, and then they're competing, they bring arguments against each other, we're trying to follow that. Uh, the, the little problem there is that there is no French Revolution out there that is, you know, that you observe and they're all trying to explain. It's all theoretically embedded. So what 
different historians consider to be the French Revolution is something else. They don't really compete because they explain different collection of events. I tried to explain it to Martin, but it was very challenging for him to try and understand that. I think part of the problem is when people don't know foreign languages, uh, they don't realize that words can have different meanings. <laughs> And in Maryland, I, very few people actually knew any foreign language. So uh, they were very literal about their approach to language. French Revolution is has only one meaning. In it. Uh, and, and then the whole thing sort of fell apart. So I ended up writing a dissertation about something entirely different, just because somebody was open. His name was Peter Cause, was just open-minded and, and polite, very British. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was able to work with him. And then the rest is, is history. Okay, yes. That's very interesting. You already talked about substantial issues, best of competing explanations, but you also um, mentioned that you did in your PhD on something else, and I think it was on Jan Patochka, right? Also, well, Czech, it's, Czech it was philosophy. more about sort of Havel. Oh, that's Havel, okay. Then, um, because it was basically something entirely opportunistic okay. that worked wonderfully, and not very philosophical. It was more history of ideas, intellectual history, <coughs> political theory. Because I was in Washington in 1990, 1989, 1990, when all the revolutions uh, in Eastern Europe were happening, communism was collapsing, uh, and Václav Havel, the new president of Czechoslovakia at the time, came to Washington in February of 1990, and he gave uh, a speech to Congress. And Havel uh, ended his speech by saying, if there is one thing we learn from history, it is that consciousness precedes being and not the other way around, which is a really wonderful way of relating to American politicians. Uh, only that I recognize the language. I knew this was Hegel. And I heard, when he was talking about being and, and technology, I heard echo of, of, he of Heidegger. Now, I, I was no expert on Heidegger. And I still not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I recognized the language, and I realized when people in the media were just writing about Havel as some kind of a liberal, uh, they were just projecting themselves on, on an alien intellectual tradition, and I could have a paper there. So very quickly, I read Being in Time, which I never did before, and the question concerning technology and so on. And I read Havel, I did the comparison, and then because Havel was referring to Patochka, I realized there was also something in between there. At that time, most of the texts of Patochka were not available in English, uh, so I read them in French. Uh, and then I very quickly published uh, an article, Václav Havel's Heideggerianism, in a journal called Telos in 1990, and that was my second article that was published. Uh, and then I had a quick topic for a dissertation that was kind of timely. and. I was lucky enough that uh, I had a fellow graduate student who was Polish, uh, and he heard about my topic, um, and his name was Jarek Gritz, and Jarek said, uh, have you heard about George Soros? And I said, George who? And he said, well, this Jewish millionaire who gives money to do research about East Europe, which was true at the time. He was not very involved in American politics, or not at all at that time. And uh, indeed, I applied. Uh, to the address that, that Jarek gave me. And then I had a two-year postdoc in Prague at the Central European University. And that was quite a nice bonus mm -hmm. for the work that I was doing. But it was not very philosophical, because the, what was interesting, with the question that I was asking at the time, in the early 1990s, people learned for the first time about uh, Heidegger's Nazi uh, association and, and the possible connection between Heidegger philosophy and Nazism. And here was a group of people who were very much into phenomenology, Husserl and Heidegger. Uh, and apparently, they, they went entirely in the opposite political direction, human rights, democracy, and so on. And the question was, for me, was, did they change something in Heidegger? Did they revise him and, and to enable them to, to go into human rights? And that, perhaps, would explain what element within phenomenology, within Heideggerian phenomenology, is politically problematic, and what is not. Uh, or whether there's just no connection, whether the, the Heidegger had the philosophy and he was a Nazi, and people had similar philosophy and they were for human rights. The answer I, I <laughs> came is closer to the first, that is, they revised Heidegger. Mm -hmm. uh, they made him more humanistic. Instead of Dasein, they speak about the soul, uh, and the soul is, in its Greek sense, the psyche, uh, which they take from Aristotle, from uh, Plato. And once they had a concept of a human being, of, of, of the essence of humanity, that's something that needed to be defended, and for that they needed human rights. That's in a nutshell. Of course, it's much more complicated and more interesting, but uh, 
Uh, so it was a, really a work that was more, I would say, intellectual history, political theory than philosophy, because I, I didn't make a contribution to, to phenomenology. Yes. I didn't like try to revise Heidegger. Or <laughs> that, that sort okay, of yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. But then you made, after that, you made big contribution to the philosophy of history and historiography, about which we are going to talk now. Um, let's first start with this. Um, you have advocated for quite some while a distinction between history and historiography, and between the philosophy of history and the philosophy of historiography, which I think now is very widespread in the field, and I've been using it in my introduction already, to some extent. Could you shortly um, explain these four concepts and why you think they should be differentiated in the way you do? Well, and you, you have uh, you di distinguished five senses, which is even better. Uh, I wanted to, to make it more economic, because the, the distinction is very simple. History is whatever happened in the past. Uh, Napoleon, uh, Julius Caesar, the Second World War. Historiography uh, is what historians write. Uh, these are representation of the past, uh, or these are the results of historiographic research. Very simple distinction, you would say, well, this, the, the object and the representation, you would be amazed to the extent to which those two are confused in the literature. When, it's, when people start talking about what historians write, and then they end up talking about the past, or they start talking about the past, they end up with what historians are writing, and, and they get it all messed up, and the, uh, um, the result is, is confusions. Uh, and it's so easy, it's so easy for, especially for people who are not trained to think in sort of uh, ordered, <laughs> clear, analytical way, to, for, for one concept to lead to another concept to lead to another concept, and then the result is conceptual deflation by overinflation. If every concept can mean more and more and more, more thing, actually in the end it doesn't mean anything. It's like a balloon that <laughs> explodes. The philosophy of historiography, then, is the philosophy of, of historiographic research. It studies uh, how historians reach the conclusions that they reach. Philosophy of history would be about the past. It's like similar to the distinction between philosophy of nature and philosophy of science. So most of the research is, of my research at least, is indeed in philosophy of historiography. There are some questions about philosophy of history that philosophers may contribute to. For example, questions about whether history is contingent or necessary. And again, uh, the contribution of, his, of philosophers would be mostly to clarify what does contingency mean, what does necessity mean? Because people who don't have a background in philosophy, they just confuse determinism with necessity uh, and contingency with uh, indeterminism. These are all entirely different concepts, and you have to clarify what you mean. And then you can approach the question of whether history it was indeed contingent and necessary, both natural history, the history of, of the species, and human history, uh, and this work on, on, on both questions. Uh, the important thing, though, is that though philosophers can um, clarify the questions about history, uh, the information, the evidence for answering those questions has to come from the discipline of history, that's some distinction that you make, uh, discipline of historical studies itself. Because philosophers can clarify what does contingency mean, uh, whether uh, it was overdetermined, uh, and there were different causal chains that would have led to the same result, or whether it was uh, um, underdetermined, that it could have been very different. But whether this was actually the case, that's, that's uh, what historians are doing. They have to study and see uh, whether there were alternative causal chains that would have led to the same result, and then it was necessary, or whether it really depended on something very small, uh, for lack of a nail, the kingdom was lost. And, that's the, and that answer is the historians have to give. Philosophers cannot, unless they just, when, when they do give the answer, they wear a different hat, the hat of a historian. Mm. Yes, great. Thanks. Um, now that brings us already right into the philosophy of historiography and into your contribution to it, now in the book that I've showed before, I can hold it up again. Our knowledge of the past. Um, you have argued that there's something like, what is my word, scientific core to historiography, and that um, historians produce very likely, and for all intents and purposes, true or truths about the past. Could you outline how they do that? Well, in a nutshell, the evidence. Uh, the, if, you want to, if you want to put it in a slogan, I would say historiography is about the evidence and not the events. If the events did not create evidence, there's no way we, we will ever know about the events, and historians can do nothing about it. 
Uh, they can only work with the evidence. They make inferences from the evidence. There's nothing observable in historiography, directly observable. We can observe the evidence, but we cannot observe the past. So everything is mediated. There's nothing uh, direct, nothing empirical, nothing observational about the past. Uh, I regard the past as an origin of information signal. Every event is kind of an explosion of information signals. Most of them decay extremely quickly and they never reach the historian. Some of them reach the historian, uh, if we are lucky, if they survive entropy, if they survive time, they are received by the historian. There's, the historian receives a signal, the historian uses common sense or theories, or the signal is obvious, to decode that signal and infer from that signal what happened in the past. That's the basic scheme uh, of the epistemology of our knowledge on the past. And please note that it doesn't matter if we're talking about events in natural history, we're talking about the Big Bang or the creation of the solar system or the evolution of species or the French Revolution. These are all events that send information signals. Different types of information signals, different media of information signals, Big Bang sent background radiation. The evolution of species sent us DNA. Histori hi the history of humanity sent us texts. Uh, but these are all information signals. And he, I would argue that historians decode them in fairly similar ways. And some of the founders of some of this field of philology was the original historical discipline. Philology, archaeology, uh, geology historiography, critical study of documents, uh, these were all the same people. And they all lived in Western Germany, or some of them in East Germany, in Jena as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just already talked about information, so you have sort of informational epistemology, as it's sometimes called in the back there. But um, if you talk a bit more on, on philosophical substance, maybe for a general audience, you have reconstructed sort of the way historiography produces knowledge with the help of Bayesian epistemology. Could you shortly explain why it's useful and do that in a way that people understand who are not into probability and Bayesianism? Yeah, that's, that's a part of my book that I think is the best part and most people who refer to the book clearly skipped that part because I use probabilistic uh, symbolism. Well, what can we know about the past and what is the status of our knowledge of the past? So on the one extreme, you would have uh, the pseudo-empiricist to say, well, you can know the past the same way that you can know that there's something across the street. You observe Napoleon, you observe the pharaohs, you observe, uh, and, 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 and then historiography is an empirical science. I think that's patently false. At the other end, there is the narrativist postmodernist view that it's all just a story. It's fiction, and there's no one account of history that is better than another. Uh, and people choose those accounts according to their identities or self-consciousness or anything that has nothing to do with the evidence. I think that's patently false as well. It's false because the degree of consensus, the degree of agreement between historians of different religions, political convictions, genders, and any other identity that uh, you would care to mention makes absolutely no sense given uh, that people, that historians just choose whichever narrative they feel like. There's just too much agreement. We have to try and explain this agreement. So between observation, sort of something that is apodictically obvious, and just fiction, anything goes, what's in the middle is probability. <laughs> uh, and, and I think it's very commonsensical that some things uh, we know with a great degree of probability, other things we are less sure about, other things about uh, the past are fairly speculative, you can say, well, could have been this, could have been that, maybe it was this, we don't really know, and some things we just don't know at all. We have, we have no way of, of knowing because there isn't enough evidence. What determines that probability is the evidence. What Bayesian logic does, or Bayesian probability does, it presents formally the relationship between evidence and hypothesis, given background knowledge. Uh, the, the question is, if this is the evidence that we have, how probable is hypothesis A in comparison with hypothesis B? Now, the formula is, of course, quantitative and precise. So one of the obvious objections is, well, 
Historians don't know that. Historians don't do this kind of mathematical computation. True enough. But there's plenty of accounts in Bayesian probability to show that we are Bayesian computing machines in many aspects of everyday life. And it does not have to be precise. What it has to do, what it has to be is um, just extremely probable versus extremely improbable. For example, suppose that we have, the evidence is that the sun is shining. We observe the sun shining. And a hypothesis is that this is daytime, right? Now, this is not absolutely certain because we may be living in this part of the world and then there may be a midnight sun and actually this is night. But given the background information that we are not in that time, we're not in the summer above the Arctic Circle, the probability that, um, we, that because the sun is shining, this is daytime, is extremely high. Not 100%, but extremely high. What's the alternative probability? This is the midnight sun, even though we're here in the winter. Uh, the gap between them is huge. How huge? I don't know. Does it matter? Does it matter if one hypothesis is 99% or 98% and another hypothesis is less than 1% or it's less than 0.1%? It doesn't matter. Just the mind does not, the, the, the probabilities can be fuzzy. It doesn't have to be exactly precise as long as the gap between them is sufficiently uh, distant. Or in the case of historiography, think about the hypothesis that there was a French Revolution. Uh, there's so much evidence that there was a French Revolution, that the probability that there was a French Revolution, that on 14 July uh, 1789, the masses stormed the Bastille, and then there was a chain of events that ended up with Bonaparte, is extremely high because it is extremely improbable that that diversity of evidence, so many documents, so many testimonies, appear there for some other reason. Now, it's not 100 percent, because there can be um, a historical uh, demon, uh, <laughs> like the Cartesian demon, sort of consistently puts all these documents in the archives <laughs> for the historians to find and, and, and cheats them and, and, and creates this, this vast conspiracy. It's just that it is so improbable. Now, how big is the gap between those two prob probabilities, the, the historiographical demon versus that there was a French Revolution? Huge. How huge exactly? I don't know, but it also doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true for uh, trials, because if you see historically, the evolution of jurisprudence went hand in hand with the evolution of historiography. The rules of evidence are pretty much the same uh, rules. So when we say beyond reasonable doubt in common law, actually in common law, it is forbidden to define it. The, the judges cannot define what is beyond reasonable doubt to the jurors. The jurors have to decide on it themselves. But what it means is just a huge gap between the probable doubt and the improbable doubt. Uh, and if the uh, doubt is improbable, meaning it's very low, nobody says exactly how low, then you can convict because it is beyond probable doubt. Yes. Same story. Yes. Uh, thanks. Um, so then, a lot of people would say there's also a lot of disagreement among historians. So historians disagree all the time with each other. They are intractable and endless debates about the cause of the French Revolution. You have the Marxists and the bourgeois historians, however, to self-classify like that. Um, so in your, in, in your theory, how would you um, account for persistent disagreement among historians? May, right. may, maybe they're overestimating it too, because they only talk about things they disagree and not about the things they agree on, but... Well, it depends disagreement about what? First, my first observation is that agreement between historians is much more interesting than disagreement. Why? Well, you would expect people to disagree about politics and religion mm -hmm. if they have different, you know, politics and religion and so on. Uh, that's what you would expect. The, the surprising thing, the, the, the thing that needs to be explained is how can they agree about so many things? That's, that's much more surprising. And my answer is, of course, the evidence. Now, what they disagree on can have uh, two reasons. Either there's insufficient evidence, and then it is under the historiography is underdetermined by the evidence, not indetermined. That is, there's, there can be enough evidence to exclude a lot of possibilities. And everybody would agree that all these hypotheses, hypotheses are improbable, but within the scope of hypothesis that has enough evidence, but not sufficient evidence to determine one of them, there can be a scope. Why do historians choose one thing or another? Well, 
usually it is because they bring with them some kind of a theoretical background that make them say this is more probable than other. They usually adopt uh, a grand theory that can come from sociology or from anthropology or from any other source that you would like that would add to the evidence that they have to make them choose this or that. But those grand theories are by themselves underdetermined by the evidence, uh, or they are too abstract and they can be interpreted in different directions, and that causes the distinction. Now, of course, historians, uh, just human nature is, that when historians talk to each other, they're not going to say, oh, we agree about this, yeah, <laughs> good friend, we agree about that, because then there's no reason why I should get a job and you shouldn't. Uh, you have to have a disagreement when you are in competition, mm -hmm. uh, and then in their mind, they, they note more the disagreements the agree, than the agreements. But as a philosopher looking from outside, I think the agreements are much more interesting. Another reason for disagreement, it has nothing to do with the evidence. And it has nothing to do with historiography. It is historians wearing different hats, being politicians, ideologues, uh, making aesthetic judgments. And here I don't see any problem, as long as we note that these disagreements are not historiographic disagreements, but disagreements about values, and human beings would have disagreement about values. And I don't think that when historians write the, their final products, this uh, narrative superstructure, they have to be, you know, vegetarian and, and ascetic and say, oh, no, I'm not going to make, you know, when I write about a concentration camp, I should not use the word horrible. It was horrible. So, so they can write it as horrible. As long as it is clear to the reader, mm. this is a value judgment. It has some basis in the evidence, but it's not only just the evidence, it's also the judgment of the historian. If that's clear, I don't see any problem there. Uh, and of course, we, I would recommend to anybody who's interested in anything serious in, in history, um, any of the great events, read more than one book. And then the effect is you see immediately what historians agree on and what is the disagreement about. And with the disagreement, uh, you can see whether it is a matter of value judgments or whether it is something about the evidence. Okay, yes. Well, let's talk about other competitive, competitor theories in the philosophy of history or historiography. Now, you already mentioned narrative superstructures. You talked about narrativist postmodernists before, which is a specific branch, I guess. But uh, I would like to talk now shortly about narrativism, which sort of has dominated the field for a few decades. But many people say it's now on the way out. Maybe it's moribund, already dead, as, 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 a, as a grand theory. Um, so I understand you are critical of narrativism, but um, given it is on the way out, is there anything good about it? It's good to say about it, too. Well, Hayden White was a very nice man. Okay. He was good. He was very colorful, uh, uh, was singing, uh, <laughs> was kind of West Coast Marxist. Uh, had the charm. Um, now about his philosophy. Um, <laughs> the, uh, of course, he was not much of a philosopher, and that's why he was not very consistent. He said a lot of things to provoke, uh, which should not be interpreted literally, uh, but he, he also contradicted himself. So th the point about any philosophical theory is what does it do for you? Does it uh, give you tools to look at the world through new eyes? Does it, uh, does it explain things that otherwise would seem uh, ponderous or, or unclear? So uh, narrativism, when it appeared with Hayden White, showed people a new way of looking at historiographic texts. And I have no problem with that. The question is, how important is it and how enlightening is it? And whether it becomes colonial, whether it starts <laughs> dealing with things that it really doesn't have the tools to deal with. And in my opinion, narrativism is really at the end. And it's not just in historiography. We have narrativism in popular science. They tell stories about great scientists and how discoveries were made and so on. And it's usually not very true, uh, which was Kuhn's, you know, one of Kuhn's basic insights. Uh, I don't have a problem with that, just as long as we remember this is at the end of the, of the story. The st what we really want to know is the relationship between the evidence and what historians are doing. After all, most of what historians are doing is going into archives or looking for evidence and finding new ways of inferring from the evidence. The narratives comes at the end. And sometimes people are more talented, sometimes people are less talented. but. A historian's historian, the kind of historian that other historians would admire and say, that was a great historian, this is, here's somebody who, who really made a contribution to the profession, is not necessarily the author of the bestseller. It's not necessarily the one who writes in the nicest, most aesthetically pleasing way. It's the one who made discoveries, 
who, who taught something new. And that's where I think the focus of the philosophy of historiography as a piece of epistemology rather than aesthetics should be. Of course, other people may disagree. Now, the research program about narrativism, I don't say, I don't think it's dead, it just exhausted itself. Mm. Uh, because what happens is that following Hayden, White, Hayden White's insight, a lot of other people started working on it. And, and what's new, what is the new to find now? Well, okay, there are these narratives, there are these uh, aesthetic models that you can apply these, these literary theories, but does that really tell you much about knowledge of the past or about the status? Really not. I mean, Hayden White moved from just analyzing the text, which is fairly uncontroversial, to actually saying it's only a text. That's when he failed. That's when he became colonial. Having said that, I just want to warn the, the, the viewers uh, <laughs> that historiography, um, I'm sorry, that, that philosophy operates more like a horror movie than a cowboy movie. In a cowboy movie, there's the good guy, there's the bad guy, and then there's the showdown at the end. The bad guy dies or disappears, and the good guy walks into the sunset for the next battle, right? In a horror movie, a good horror movie, like Alien or something like that, you think you killed the monster, but the monster always comes back. Mm -hmm. in di but in a different guise, it's, it's, it evolves. <laughs> then you think you killed it again, and it comes back again. The history of philosophy works much more like a horror movie. Okay. The monster always comes back. Okay. Just is a cycle. So uh, I would say maybe the cycle of narrativism now is at an end, but it will be back <clears throat> in another 50 years. In a new guise, it will come back. Okay. That's, yeah. That relates to my next question, monster or not. One thing that has, monster or not, one thing that is coming back currently in the philosophy of history, historiography, is realism and realist. There's been some publications about this. Um, wh what do you think about this resurgence? And what do you think about uh, how the question of realism should be approached? Because it's like also one of these perennial topics. And even the discussion seems to be... Uh, being reinventing the wheel in, a, in, a, in one way or another. So I think maybe the interesting, the interesting approach would be to approach it differently or somehow right. to get the, ahead. The realism is a question about the relationship between historiography and history. And as I argued, I have argued, there is no direct answer. You can't compare the text with reality because reality is always gone. It's not there except in cosmology where you can actually observe the past. Uh, but uh, there is no obvious direct answer. There is there's plenty of literature from philosophy of science that philosophers of historiography can look at and, and examine. What is special about historiography and philosophy of historiography in relation to this debate about realism and anti-realism is what I would call the optimistic induction. Because one of the strongest arguments for anti-realism in the philosophy of science, especially in physics, is known as what Larry Lawden called the pessimistic induction. That is, all hitherto major theories in physics were proven false. Hence, the current theory of physics will be, false, will be proven false as well. In physics, this is extremely probable because uh, contemporary physics is internally inconsistent. Gravity does not fit with the theory of gravity does not fit with the other theories. Quantum theory includes all sorts of absurdities and it's not very consistent with Einsteinian relativity theory. So if this is the final picture that science can give us, this kind of inconsistent theory of, of, of the world, if this is the last thing that science gives us, well, obviously it's, un, it's not realistic. It's may, it may be rational, but that's not how the world is. And uh, I would be astounded. I mean, I'm not going to be there 100 years from now, but I would have been astounded had I come, had I returned 100 years from now and physics would have been similar to what it is today. I would actually think that it's a major failure. That means, you know, science really failed to make sense of nature. But look at historiography. There was one scientific revolution that we associate with Ranke, but I, will, I argue it's, a, it's actually a much larger revolution that started with philology in the middle of the 18th century. But there was one revolution. It's like, imagine that in physics it was just Newton. Newton was never falsified. There was never Einstein, never quantum. You know, everything just went smoothly and just Newton got expanded and, and but would never overturn because there's really nothing major that Ranke said that we say today, it was wrong. Ranke was right. The, and, and the optimistic induction, and that would give us some reason 
to think that realism may be more probable than its alternative. And note my word, I'm not saying realism is right. I'm saying, how probable is it? Uh, that it was, that so far, nothing major was overturned since the invention of scientific historiography. The field simply expanded because historians learned to use broader sources of evidence than they were available to Ranke. Uh, and that allowed them to make more, we know more about the past now that we knew 50 years ago, and, and 50 years ago we knew more than we had known 100 years ago, and so on and so forth, since Ranke. Um, Ranke overturned some conclusions that were before him, pre-scientific historiography, but, but we, we just expanded. From that, the induction, and it's just an induction, it's not a deduction, uh, it's an induction, that it will go on like this. We, in 50 years from now, we will know more than we know today, but we will not overturn. We will not say, oh, what we think, to, there was no French Revolution, there was no Napoleon, uh, mm -hmm. there was something else going on, there was no nationalism, there was something else going on, and so on and so forth. So, so that would give probability to a realistic interpretation of historiography, but note, it's just probable, and I'm not even saying how probable. Right. Uh, mm. right. And it doesn't tell you anything about um, what the real plays, what role the real plays in the in the work of the historian, like because often the realists sort of argue um, we need the real past so as to do any historiography, but no, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything in the actual we research. We don't deal with the real yeah, past. Yeah, we deal the with, the, with the real evidence. Yes, yes, yes. And then we make inferences from the evidence. Mm. The inferences may be wrong. But I think the way that the profession operates is that people, that historians reach wrong conclusions, but then they are corrected by other historians. So uh, uh, the, the historiographic community works to create probable inferences. But again, these are probable, they're not certain, they're probable inferences, and mm -hmm. it makes sense to think that they are probably correct. Of course, there are whole parts of the past, actually, most of the past, we simply don't know. Mm -hmm. So they, it's not a realist or anti-realist. If, if you say something about it, just it's baseless and uh, <laughs> you speculate. Yes. And all these kind of grand theories that some historians would think is revolutionary, like Marxism or, or sort of some kind of post-structuralist understanding of language that they come across and then employs. In your understanding, they're not scientific revolutions in any sense, because they're underdetermined theories, they're bad, they bad philosophies, might be bad philosophies or good philosophies, but they're not, right? You know, Marx was not a scientist, uh, and I don't think uh, too many, I mean, that was a Soviet interpretation through Plekhanov that, that Marx was, was the Newton of, uh, or, or it's also in Engels, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that Marx was the Newton of, of history. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that, like that. that's very 19th century. Yes. Um, um, if for no other reason Newton was of a turn, you want to say he was the Einstein of history or whatever. Uh, but, but there's just too much gaps between, it's, it's very easy to falsify Marx, or you have to push him in such an abstract direction and, and start making ad hoc fixes, you know. This was wrong, okay, he was just wrong about this, but if we fix it, and then you end up with, with, with a, uh, with, the, with what the Italians call tarantella. It's kind of a, a, uh, a car that is so <laughs> patched up and, and it hardly goes because it's so awkward. Uh, you, would have, you would have to do that. But what historians do with, when, when they use Marx or Weber or anthropology and, and so on, they, they use that to, to patch in the holes. When, when something is underdetermined because there isn't enough evidence, they add the favorite theory, or to be more precise, they add an interpretation of the favorite theory because the, these grand theories are too vague to abstract, to actually tell you what mm. happened in, in a particular time in history. And then what you would see is, is that there is this kind of genealogy that the different interpretations of the same theory are conflicting with, with each other. And, and Marx is an excellent example. I mean, there are plenty of Marxist historians, and Marxism was uh, fruitful as, as an incentive for people to be interested in historiography, as long as they were not too dogmatic. But then they pushed Marx in opposite directions. Uh, like, what was the French Revolution? Was that the bourgeois revolution? Uh, but actually, if you, if you look carefully, uh, Paris did not have a bourgeois. This was lumpen proletariat who did the, the revolution. So was it this or what is that? And then Marxists would disagree among each other uh, about the interpretation of the theory, how to apply it, and so on. Uh, so that, I don't think that, that's, again, that's part of this, this underdetermined part of, of historiography, which does not offer us knowledge, it's, that, that's more speculative or underdetermined uh, hypothesis, hypothesis. The application of post-structuralism or the linguistic turn to historiography, I think, is based to a large extent on 
unfamiliarity with philosophy. Um, because um, the interesting thing for me as a philosopher is to see the practice, what historians are doing, not what they think they're doing. Because usually uh, people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Uh, as a psychological insight. The, the, the classical joke about two psychoanalysts meeting each other on Park Avenue in New York and telling each other spontaneously, you are fine, how am I? I think that's very true. Uh, historians, especially if they don't know philosophy, and most of them don't, they don't have the conceptual framework to analyze the epistemology of what they're doing. What, they're, what they tend to do, and that starts in Ranke, uh, with Ranke, they pick up on something fashionable that would legitimize, or they think that would legitimize what they're doing, they try to apply it, in, and, and mostly in, inappropriately. I mean, Ranke thought he was an empirical scientist. <laughs> he was observing the French Revolution. It's ridiculous. What Ranke was doing was pure genius. He was right, but it was not empirical. He, he misunderstood understood what he was doing. Late 19th century, they were using positivist model to try and explain what they're doing, which was also wrong. So now they're using post-structuralism. Of course, post-structuralism does not explain anything about the evidence, and they spend most of their life working with evidence. They go to the archives, uh, they, they, they don't go to, uh, to uh, do a, a structuralist analysis of texts, they, they do something else. And then, if they're not familiar with philosophy of science, epistemology, most of them don't, they pick up on something easy to understand, uh, linguistic turn, this and that, they try to legitimize it, and actually they are delegitimizing their the work, but, but it's irrelevant. Uh, it's based on, on sheer misunderstanding of their practice, which is not unusual, uh, because uh, dolphins are not usually experts on hydrodynamics. And hydrodynamics experts, engineers, they don't necessarily know how to swim. And that's not a problem. As long as you don't think, because I'm a great dolphin, now I can do hydrodynamics. It doesn't work. Okay, yes. Um, one more question on the philosophy of historiography, or broadly before we come to historical sciences. Um, there, are, there are people who sort of in, uh, include the philosophy of history, historiography, into a wider field called theory of history or, or, or historical theory, where it then go, is about what they call our general past relationships, some say historical cultures, other use the practical past. Um, what do you think about this proposal and about theory of history in general? Yes, sir. I, think, I guess you will think it's legitimate to think about other past relationships and historiography as well, but... Well, there's a conceptual issue and a sociological issue. Mm -hmm. Conceptual, there's no problem. Historiography has a theory. Of course, uh, historians are using theoretical background, and I argue that it's mostly information theory, they, how to decode information messages from the past. That's not a problem, that's just a term. Sociologically, what it means is we are historians, we are great dolphins, and we don't need to know hydrodynamics because we just do phenomenology of our actions as dolphins. Uh, that is, uh, it's the attempt to use abstract terms and be self-conscious about historiographic practices without knowing anything about philosophy. Because people call themselves theoreticians of historiography, with obvious exceptions. They don't feel like they need to know epistemology or philosophy of science or philosophy of language. They can't use those tools. And when they use concepts that come from epistemology and philosophy of science without having the background, it becomes embarrassingly confused. They use terms like causation, explanation, in ways that are so sloppy, that are so oversimplified, that come only from, they can only emerge from the conviction that if you, if you are a good dolphin, you don't need to study hydrodynamics. Uh, that if you are a historian, you wrote a good book, it got good reviews, okay, now you can sit in the, on, your, on your armchair and ask, what am I doing? Uh, and, and use all kind of abstract concepts without knowing what they mean. And, and what usually happens is that it's oversimplistic, and then it starts getting confused because it's very easy to say, you know, I know what is midnight. Midnight is really like one o'clock in the morning. It's very near. One o'clock in the morning is like two o'clock. And then you end up that midnight is like midday and you have conceptual deflation by overinflation. They just move from one concept to another smoothly, sort of slidingly, without having this kind of clear thinking how concepts are distinct from each other. And then it ends up a conceptual mess. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure it's going to make me very popular with, <laughs> with many of our colleagues, but they really do need to study some philosophy. It's useful. Okay, yeah, well, uh, I agree. Um, and you have um, made another distinction. You have made a conceptual distinction of, of the sciences, which you call the historical sciences, as a meta-classification of the sciences, not 
the other classification, social and natural sciences, and so forth. And you have opposed those um, historical sciences to what you call the theoretical sciences. And um, this historical sciences, you conceive of them, they cut across the known differentiation between historical sciences, arbitrary between natural sciences and social sciences, but also humanities. So for you, um, historical sciences include obviously historiography, but also archaeology, evolutionary biology, cosmology, some parts of geology, I suppose. Um, can you sort of outline what unites the historical science and why this is a better differentiation than all we had before, or the historical and the theoretical sciences? Right, so people, philosophers have been debating since the beginning of the 19th century how to divide the sciences. And accordingly, how to structure the university. Because the fact that we have today faculties of humanities, it's based on a philosophical assumption uh, that humanities are different from natural science. The problem is that the distinction between human sciences and natural sciences uh, became obsolete when, when psychology was invented. Uh, now, Hegel, who was uh, a great supporter of this distinction, he tried to use bureaucratic means to impose this worldview. So as long as Hegel was the great professor in Humboldt, in what would become Humboldt University in Berlin, there was no psychology professor. Now we have a science of psychology, there's a science of sociology, there's a science of economics, and so on and so forth. Uh, we can debate exactly how scientific they are, but it's definitely there are such sciences. So the distinction between sciences according to subject matters, human versus inhuman, social versus individual, that's all obsolete. It's, and it has been obsolete now for 200 years. Having said that, uh, there are distinctions in methods. And my argument has been that there is a difference between how we infer things about the past, how we infer knowledge of the past, from how we infer knowledge of theoretical entities that are timeless. So, for example, if I talk about species, cells, humans, these are all timeless entities. So we can have a psychological theory of humans. You can have a biological theory of cells. You can have a bi physiological theory about species. Then there are uh, inferences about token events, things that happen in a particular space at a particular time. Or think about the distinction between Chomskyan linguistics, which is timeless and spaceless, and comparative linguistics about actual historical languages that were spoken by particular groups of people at particular uh, space at a particular time. Um, and the same thing is the difference between theory of a revolution, which is part of sociology, and the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution, and so on and so forth. My argument is that these require two different groups of inferences. So, as I said, when you have an event, there's an explosion of information, the information signals, most of them decay, they are coded, there are information signals that reach the, some of them reach the present, they are received, and then the historian, doesn't matter if historian of humanity, historian of, bio, of life, historian of the cosmos, historian of planet Earth, they have to decode those messages, and then they infer from them backward the origin of those uh, information signals, and that ends up, this inference is the basis for the inference of historiography. By contrast, when a sociologist studies the French Revolution, he's not interested in Paris. He's not interested, or she's not interested in Moscow. She's not interested in, the, in 1917. She's interested in something that is timeless and spaceless that was instantiated to a certain degree in 1917 in St. Petersburg and Moscow in Paris in 1789. They're not interested in a lot of peculiarities of these events, because exactly because they're not repet repetitive. Whereas uh, historians are interested in particular events that happen in a particular space in a particular time. Now, this sounds like a fairly uh, abstract distinction, but um, it goes to the foundation of the methodologies, because you can show, and I, and I try to show, that the methodologies of cosmology, evolutionary biology, philology, archaeology, human history, and so on, are very, very similar. They just deal with different types of information signal that require different types of information theories to decode them when decoding is necessary. But the actual form of inference is very similar, and the founders of these fields in many cases, either were the same people or they read each other 
uh, and used the methodologies of the predecessors to apply the same methodologies to different types of information signals. First, there was philology in the mid-18th century and late 18th century. Then there was textual criticism when they were using the, method the methodologies of philology to work on the um, New Testament, Old Testament, Homer, and so on. From that, obviously, you can move very easily to historiography, just different types of text, but you use the same methodology. And Ranke's background was in philology and theology. He didn't study history. Uh, and then a short leap from that goes to, into evolutionary biology, because Darwin, in the evolution of in the origin of species, when he tries to convince the reader to explain to them his theory, he says species are like languages. Because the idea that languages have these trees and they emerged from common origins was already very familiar by the time Darwin is writing. The, th the, the idea that species work like languages, that was a new idea. So Darwin tries to explain that, the species, by referring to languages. Obviously, that was in his mind, if for no other reason, because his cousin and brother-in-law, because he married his cousin, uh, was writing etymologies for dictionaries. Right. Um... So you, you're not the only one who works on the philosophy of the historic science. There are a few other people, among them Carol Cleland and Derek Turner. And there was an interesting debate, I think, between the three of you on the degree of underdetermination of the historical sciences and where they are at a great disadvantage compared to the, perhaps not the theoretical, but the experimental sciences in particular. Could you sort of talk about this discussion shortly and what your position is on it? And also, um, do you think we should have a similar discussion in the philosophy of historiography? Well, maybe it's difficult to have had but on the general level about the... No, I think, the okay. uh, yeah. I think it's the same story. Uh, Carol Cleland and, and Derek Turner are two excellent philosophers of historiography, of historical sciences. Uh, they work more about uh, what we, natural history, archaeology, um, uh, geology and so on, biology. Um, Carol Cleland borrowed some arguments from David Lewis and Popper originally. She regards this event, the original event that I was talking about, as something that, that resembles a stone that you throw into a puddle, and then it creates these waves. The waves is information. And the idea there, and that's from David Lewis, is uh, a mainstream philosopher, uh, that uh, there's a lot of redundancy or overdetermination of the past by the present. Because if, if you Imagine that you throw the stone into the puddle and then there are these waves, right? So suppose some of them sort of reach some obstacle and they don't get any... Well, enough of them get there that when you look at, let's say, a wave that survived here and a wave that survived there, you can reconstruct in your mind that there was a stone that, that came there. Or uh, the other example, if a ball hits a window and shatters the window and somebody goes and clean it, well, there are so many pieces of, of glass, that even if you discover one or two, that's sufficient for you to make the inference that a window was broken here. Derek Turner said the opposite, made the opposite argument, basically an argument from entropy. That is, uh, gradually, information signals are lost in history, and then uh, it's impossible to infer what happened in the past, because the information signal is lost. Um, his example, his unfortunate example, is the color of the dinosaurs. Because he said that pigments, scientifically we know that pigments deteriorate, and pigments from all those millions of years ago, we, we cannot find them today, and then we would never know the, the color of the dinosaurs. And almost before the color on his ink was dry, <laughs> uh, scientists actually discovered a way to uh, infer the colors of dinosaurs from the shape of the, um, of the cells or, or I don't know if that's cells, but the, the, biological, mm -hmm. from the shape rather than the color of, of things that did survive. And then they could prove that some dinosaurs were striped. Um, so, uh, um, and here's a nice argument for Carol Cleland. My argument is that philosophers cannot answer this question. They can clarify the question, but the extent to which information survives is something that you need to look at what historians or historical scientists are doing. It is not an a priori question that you can decide from the, co from the comforts of your philosophical study, from your armchair. It really depends on what. Uh, I would certainly think about when you, when, when you talk about uh, human history, there are some things that I would definitely think are lost forever. The pre-Socratic 
texts, for example. I mean, they were texts, they were written, let's say they were in the library in Alexandria, then they were burnt first by Julius Caesar, then by the um, uh, Muslim conquerors, uh, <laughs> that dissipated into the atmosphere. So can you <laughs> possibly imagine how we will find this, I don't know, whatever became of the sh shreds and shards and reconstruct the, the original pre-Socratic text, taking an obvious example. What were, the what were the religious convictions of cavemen who um, uh, painted those beautiful uh, caves in, in France and, and Spain? Uh, there are so many questions that it's difficult to imagine how, an inf how information could be found. But as in the case of the color of the dinosaurs, there are surprises, uh, and we progressively know more about the past than we ever knew before. Uh, there's so many, and, and historians keep discovering new things. So what would be the limit? I, I mean, I believe that as with um, the debate about whether there's a limit on how fast humans can run, there is some such limit. But where exactly it is is more an empirical question about how, how, uh, how well historians are doing, what and what is the limit? But we, we are definitely far from that limit. Mm -hmm. We certainly will learn more about the past than we know today. It's a the historiography or the historical sciences are definitely progressive sciences. They are advanced. They will know more and more all the time. Yes. I guess an interesting topic is there also how far we, how far we progress in what is called prehistory, where there's no reliable way of uh, recording and then transmitting information. So a lot about the mental past of those people is, for all we know, very likely lost, like you said there. Uh, religion of the Lascaux cave or whatever, or what language has even they spoke, but perhaps by, by future archaeological or other finds, we might infer certain culture. I mean, there's the Venus of Willendorf and this sort of things, but what, what they mean, but we might, there might be a way of referring well, there, more there about three, them. There are three types of signals from prehistory. Uh, that is, from history um, prior to the invention mm. of writing and, and the creation of documents. There's DNA, mm -hmm. the biological uh, evidence, there are um, artifacts and there are languages. Uh, and the synthesis between these three fields generated a lot of new knowledge of the past, as well as just uh, the discovery of, of new evidence. So, for example, only in the last few years we learned that humans, non-African humans, are the result of hybrids between Homo sapiens that came out of Africa and Neanderthals. So uh, uh, we all have a bit of a Neanderthal is in us, uh, and that's that's a fascinating discovery that changes our whole idea of who we are and and the relationship between species and so on. And that's something that DNA discovered uh, and, and new methods for analyzing DNA and extracting uh, DNA from old species. Uh, just in the in, in the last few years, and I would be astounded if we don't discover more things. Uh, something it's difficult to imagine what sort of evidence could possibly be discovered that would give us a definite um, mm -hmm. yeah. um, answer to to some very interesting questions, such as the religion of of um, um, prehistorical human tribes, uh, whether Neanderthals had the language. Uh, how did Neanderthals and humans communicate beyond the obvious sexual intercourse <laughs> that we are, we are the living proof <laughs> thereof. Uh, yes. Um, so one final question on historical science and philosophy. Two days ago or something, you gave a talk here called Origins and Origination. And from what I understand, in the newest work, you talk about um, or originary sciences. I think that's right, yeah. And about origination instead of, we talked before about common causes, I think. Could you tell us why you changed your concepts and what is the advantage of this new Right, because concept? originally, uh, <laughs> in, uh, for example, in the book on our knowledge of the past, <laughs> I thought that much of what historians are doing is inferring common causes. I came to change my mind and think uh, it's not really about causation. Causation is not that important. It's there, but it's not very important. What historians are actually doing is inferring common origins, which are origins of information signals. It's not about causation. It supervenes on causation. There's some causation below it, but we really don't even need to know what the causation is, uh, what the causal chain was, as long as we know it was a reliable transmission of information. And the argument is that in this way, 
historians and historical scientists are able to generate knowledge of the past, not just to receive, not just to receive transmission, but generate new knowledge that is not in the signals. Uh, let me give you a very simple everyday example, and then I'll explain how it works in the historical sciences. Uh, I stay here in Hotel Lapland, a very nice hotel, very good breakfast, definitely recommend it uh, for the viewers at home. Uh, now, suppose you ask me, uh, you heard about the, the good restaurant, uh, and, you, and, and I would recommend you make a reservation, can I give you the phone number? I would have to tell you, you know, I, I saw that phone number once, I cannot transmit it, this number to you, because um, I can't remember it, I just see a number once, my mind is not that good, at this advanced age to remember it. Uh, and you tell me, okay, you know what? I'll tell you Hotel Upland and you will tell me the first phone number that comes into your head. And I'm a friendly guy and I co I'm cooperative and I do that, but, and I give you a number, but then I warn you, look, don't trust me on this. I'm not a reliable witness. This number can be anything that comes into my head. Then I think we can agree that I did not transmit this information to you. Because, and the reason is that I don't have that information, I don't have the knowledge to begin with, I have nothing to transmit there. And therefore, you don't know the number. Very simple. But, suppose, I'll tell the, the viewers at home a secret, Yoni Mati Kukhanen is sitting right here. Uh, and suppose you ask Yoni exactly the same question. What is the phone number of Hotel Upland? And suppose Yoni answers you exactly the same answer that I gave you. He can't remember it, he saw it once, not reliable. And again, you tell him, okay, let's play a game, just tell me the first number that comes into your head when I say Hotel Lapland. And Yoni tells you, and, and Yoni was not here, I mean, it's very important, it's independent. Yoni did not hear me say the, the, that number. Uh, and Yoni tells you exactly the same number. What is the probability that this is a coincidence? That probability is negligible. We know there was a common origin to these two answers. What you just need to eliminate is that this number is not some other common origin other than the Hotel Upland. It could be number of a taxi company or something like that. If you can eliminate that, knowledge was generated. Now, this sounds almost trivial. And the first philosopher to point this out was Laplace in the early 19th century. For contemporary philosophy, for contemporary epistemology, this is totally revolutionary. <laughs> Because the positivists assumed that knowledge can be generated either empirically from observation or from a priori sources, deduction, induction, and so on. Now, what I just did is I generated knowledge from testimony. And testimonies, according to the positivists, just dogmatically, they were only possible, they were only able to transmit knowledge that was generated elsewhere. That is, you generated empirical knowledge and then you either remember it or you tell it to somebody else. That's a transmission. Transmission can only be as probable as its origin, it cannot be more probable. But notice what I just did. I generated knowledge from totally improbable, unreliable source, me, in this case. I tell you I can't remember the number. I tell you somebody, and somebody else tells you I can't remember the number. But you put those two things together, it's just so improbable that this is a coincidence that knowledge is generated. Now, Let's look at languages, philology, the first science. Sanskrit and ancient Greek. You look at those similarities. It's just like the phone number. How probable that these similarities are coincidental? Now, any, if you compare any two words and they are similar, it's highly probable that they are similar because there's only so many sounds that the human larynx can produce so that every language will have some words that are similar and it doesn't mean anything. But if you have systematic, repeated similarities, in vocabulary, in the structure of the grammar, and so on and so forth. It's highly improbable that it does not have some kind of a common origin. And it doesn't matter what is the causal chain. I mean, we don't know what is the causal chain that connected Sanskrit with Greek. I mean, there are, there are speculations about Anatolia, about the Indo-European tribes, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, what we need to know is that it's highly improbable that these two informations, groups of information signals that are received, that the similarity is coincidental. This is for languages. You look at text, you compare text, you can infer what are the common origins of text. You look at historical documents, when they have similar propositional content, contents, uh, or when they are consistent. How probable are these similarities if there's no common origin? You look at species, how, how probable it is that there are all these similarities between humans and apes and there was no common origin? Highly improbable. How, and you look at geology, how probable is the similarity between 
the rock structure, the sediments in Western Africa and Eastern Brazil, if they were not once part of the same continent. Highly improbable that it would you know, fit so nicely. And, and of course, uh, Appalachia and, and Scotland and so on, highly improbable. Uh, and then you look at the structure of the universe. How probable are the this, co this coordinated action of the um, of the galaxies of how they expand if there was no common origin, the Big Bang? So what you see, it's all the same thing. Uh, it's it's all the same type of inference with different types of information signals. And what they are doing is they're all inferring origins. So my argument is what is common to all the historical sciences is that they have a common origin. And, and then we should have philosophy of the historical sciences. And that's what I'm working on now, both in my book and I'm co-editing with David Chernin, my colleague in Ostrava, uh, a handbook for the philosophy of the historical sciences or the philosophy of big history it would be perhaps a more catchy title that we'll get to uh, non-academics uh, and that will be published by Bloomsbury next year, hopefully. Uh, so we will try to establish this new field and basically go back to rethink the new Kantian division between the sciences and, and update it according to contemporary philosophy of science uh, and perhaps who knows, restructure the university uh, in, in different, or at least create a theoretical foundation for restructuring uh, the university. Right. That's and I'm not ambitious at all. Fasc fascinating uh, perspective. Now, um, I want to talk about shortly about your political philosophy, too. You have a political philosophy and interesting points there, but I'm just mentioning here um, that you also did work in general epistemology, what you just explained here, the creation of um, knowledge via Generation of knowledge via individually unreliable testimonies. Also, you made a work on memory in that respect, and you have worked on um, the epistemic significance of certain forms of consensus. I'm not going to talk about it here now, but I, it's in the book and, and, and other places of yours. So. so, right now, shortly to political f philosophy before we wrap up, um, I think there are three things I would like to talk to you about here your theory of totalitarianism, your I guess, theory of liberalism and panarchy. These are all things that you have been working on. Um, first, maybe on uh, totalitarianism. I think you have a book where you differentiate totalitarianism and then uh, late and post-totalitarianism. And I think especially post-totalitarianism is also a, um, a notion, a concept which we, by which we can analyze our current present, right? Could you explain this? Right. And your well, um, of course, I arrived in post-totalitarian Czechoslovakia in 1992, and I had, I was working actually mostly in, in departments of political science, and uh, I developed a theory of what I call post-totalitarianism. Uh, I would divide totalitarianism into three phases. So first there was the revolutionary totalitarian project, and here my work emerges out of the work of Hannah Arendt, whose famous argument, uh, she was to show the similarities between Nazism and communism uh, and show that uh, irrespective of the diverging ideologies, actually this was the same kind of regime. My argument is uh, that for a totalitarian regime to be established, they had to eliminate about 10% of the population, all the alternative elites. They had to kill them or jail them or exile them. and. Um, the reason for that is that totalitarianism cannot allow alternative elites. There has to be a unified pyramid, class pyramid in society with a single elite. And anybody who is outside that elite gets killed or, or exiled or jailed. And then people within the elite uh, who uh, compete with each other, they have to kill each other as well. Otherwise, there's no mechanism to... Um, push people into the House of Lords, as it were, to, to, to tolerate alternative elites. And uh, so there's the absence of alternative elites and the elimination of all alternative elites. Late totalitarianism start when all these alternative elites indeed have already been eliminated. And then the surviving elite has to protect itself from itself and reach some kind of a gentlemanly agreement that they're not going to kill each other anymore or their families. So people can get demoted, but they're not, they're not killed anymore. And they don't need to kill other people anymore because all the alternative elites are, are dead and they don't need, there's, there's no competition. So uh, the level of oppression decreases and uh, consequently, uh, fewer people die and the 
regime tells people, if you are not against us, you're with us. Just be politically passive and do what we tell you, and then uh, we will not persecute you. Post-totalitarianism happens once this is over, uh, after 1989 or uh, after 1945. Uh, and the problem there is that there are no alternative elites. And that's why there's much more continuity between late totalitarianism and post-totalitarianism than many people allow for. Because the groups of the dissidents were very few, except in Poland, but it was a mass movement solidarity. And that's why, arguably, Poland in the 1980s was already not a totalitarian country. Uh, the, and it was an independent church. Uh, everywhere else, there was nobody to replace the, the, the old communist elites or the old Nazi elites. So there was much more continuity, at least for another generation. Why is this important? It's important if you want to understand what happened after totalitarianism. That really was my challenge. That's what I was interested in. I was not so interested in totalitarianism as much as in explaining post-totalitarianism. And the comparison, because if you want to do political science, you need to make a comparison. The comparison was both authoritarian regimes, uh, such as in Southern Europe, Spain, Portugal, Greece, or in Latin America. Uh, there was a huge debate around 1980 about American foreign policy with Jinky Patrick arguing there is this huge difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism, and then academics who were more sympathetic to totalitarianism and more anti-democratic say, well, it's all the same, it's just authoritarian. <laughs> um, now, what I argue is that you just look at the differences between those regimes, not while they were happening so much as what happened later. Now, authoritarian regime typically kill, jail, exile uh, about 0.1% of the population the ones that are politically active. In comparison with 10% in totalitarian societies, just compare, let's say, Hungary with Argentina. Similar sizes of population, just look how many people were disappeared in Argentina, were murdered there, how many people went to the gulags and were killed in Hungary. Uh, it's a hundredfold, roughly. Um, which is something that, that some political scientists are just in denial about. Now, that means that when you have to deal with the victims, victims that are 0.1% of the population, it's a hell lot easier, a hell lot cheaper and much more possible to, to compensate them than when you deal with 10% of the population their families. Uh, and it also means that there were no alternative political elites in post-authoritarian societies, but there were other elites. Uh, people could be rich, could, people could be sports stars, people could be academics, people could be lawyers, and all that, this, the authoritarian state did not intervene so much in those realms of life. So these people could move in and reconstruct liberal democracy in a way that was just impossible for, at least for a generation, after totalitarianism, because the middle classes, the, the, the professionals, were absent, they were not there. Uh, and that's why you would see much more continuity than is possible in a place like Spain. Uh, in, in a place like uh, in Spain already, at the end of Franco's regime, there were um, open exams for, for the civil service. So these people were already not political and they could continue in place. But in Germany, in West Germany, the Nazi judges went on working until the 60s. Uh, in post-communist Europe, the communist judges went on, like people who had no idea what, what is rule of law and, and, and were making decisions on the basis of politics, uh, went on working there for another generation until there was somebody to replace them. And still there's a problem with, with the culture. Uh, so um, the basic controversial argument is really a huge difference between totalitarianism and authoritarianism, and not so much perhaps because of, of what was going on as, as much as what happens later. The limits that totalitarianism make on creation of the rule of law, democracy, liberalism, long after totalitarianism itself is gone. It's one thing to open the borders, let people come in and out. That's that you can do immediately. Mm -hmm. in, in the Czech case, you know, I asked, what was the first thing that people noted after 1989, when there was a revolution? Two things, night trains to Vienna, so they can see how freedom looks like. Nobody had enough money for a hotel, so they would take the <laughs> night train in the, in, the, in the night, spend the day in Vienna, and take the other night train. And sesame. Under communism, there, were no, there was no sesame on bombs, because although sesame is very cheap, uh, it's imported. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's too cold in Europe to make sesame. Uh, so the first sort of entrepreneurship was to import sesame and put it on bonds. That's, very, that's the easy part. Creating the rule of law, civil society, that takes much longer. The 
And, and the important thing is this is not an ethical judgment. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not endorsing Pinochet or, <laughs> or, or desk quotes or whatever, but I am pointing that there's a difference between a regime that kills 0.1 of the population and a regime that kills 10 percent of the population, not just ethically, but or, or from a utilitarian perspective, how many people suffer, but in terms of the limitations that this creates for what you can achieve later once the bad regime disappears. Because the, the, the example that I give to students when I teach this is, suppose uh, about post-totalitarianism, is suppose that you have this kind of 1960s student revolt against the administration. And you do a sit-in and so on, and nothing works, and they kick people out and, and suppress it. And then one day, the president of the university invites you in and say, you won. Here are the keys to the university. Good luck. Then I ask a student, what would you do? So people say, of course, we'll have a party. We'll, go, we'll, we'll raid the wine cellar and so on. Nobody thinks is, where is the endowment? Where's the money of the university? Because what this president of the university would do on his way out, on her way out, would be to stop in the bank and withdraw all the money from, of the university. There would be no money left. And that's exactly what the communist nomenclatura did. They, they gave the keys to the state and they stole all the money. And there was nobody to operate the state. That creates all these limitations that in places like Spain, Greece, this did not, did not happen. On the other hand, since there was no civil society in post-totalitarian Europe, governments were able to do reforms that were impossible in places like Greece and Spain. Because in Greece and Spain, they were accountable to civil society, to trade unions, they had to create jobs, they bankrupted the state <laughs> in the process. This was not a limit or in, in post-totalitarian regimes because they were not accountable. So they could, they could do this kind of radical reforms to the economy mm -hmm. without any limits because the trade unions were a joke to begin with. There were phony trade unions that the communists created mm -hmm. and they were in charge of giving vacations to workers that didn't represent their interests. Yes, uh, thanks, yes. I guess um, one way of describing the difference perhaps between totalitarianism and authoritarianism of foreign state is too that perhaps under some forms of authoritarian state you can have scientific historiography and you can have other historical sciences and it can be rather unbothered, whereas you don't find that in totalitarian regimes. And I'm asking that because I know that you have a book called Democracy Against Liberalism, I believe, mm -hmm. where you argue, I think that, or maybe you argue that, that um, for historiography to thrive, you only need liberalism, but not democracy or that can well, work. It's one of the minor arguments. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, larger, yes, yes. so maybe you want to talk about the book shortly, what, what it is about and maybe the implication for historiography. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a common misconception that liberalism and democracy go together. That's really only post-Second World War synthesis that worked until Trump and so on. Uh, before that, for almost the whole of political history, the two things were fairly distinct of each other. Democracy emerged in Greeks, uh, in Athens, and it emerged without any form of liberalism, meaning uh, people decided about everything. People voted on, on the results of trials. Famously, you know, Socrates is, uh, <laughs> was, it was a vote. Uh, people voted on who were the military commanders. Uh, people executed the military commanders. For example, the son of Pericles participated in a debacle in a naval battle, which probably was not even his fault, it was the weather, uh, and they voted to, to execute him when Pericles was their leader, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So the, repu the, the historical reputation of democracy was very bad, because it was associated with mob rule, with, with um, bad decisions that people make on the basis of their passions, irrational decisions. Uh, and um, liberalism emerged in England uh, with Magna Carta. Liberalism means that some things that are not decided politically, not by the king, not by the prime minister, not by democratically. It doesn't matter how you elect your, your representative, how, how the government happens, whether it's authoritarian or, or, or um, democratic. Uh, the first independent institution, of course, is the judiciary. That, uh, Judges decide according to the law, not according to vote, not according to the vote of the people, but according to common law. But then other institutions became separate from the state, religion, the BBC, the, the media, uh, education. So even when, academic freedom means that even if the state pays for education, there is an autonomy. The state does not tell the universities how to be run. 
Uh, that's liberalism. And, and what liberalism did is it accumulated gradually more and more institutions who, are, who became depoliticized. Uh, more recent, most recently, let's say, the central bank, the idea that setting up interest rates is not something that the government decides on, but there's an independent technocratic group of people that is given a task, you want to minimize inflation, protect the currency, uh, maximize uh, participation in the labor market, and so on. Uh, that's independent of that. Now, in order to have historiography that is not politicized, you don't need democracy. Actually, sometimes democracy is a minus. You need liberalism. You need the state not to tell historians what to write. Uh, an example for illiberal democracies, you look at what happens in, in places like Florida or Australia. Uh, democratically elected, of course, uh, but they have anti-historiographic policy. They want to dissuade people from studying the past. They charge, they want to charge people more. In, in, in Australia, it happened, even though they, they found ways, the universities found ways around it. But uh, and, and in Florida, it was a proposal. I don't think it, it's, it's been enacted yet, to simply charge higher tuition from somebody who wants to study history than from somebody who wants to do engineering. That's as anti-historiographic <laughs> as it gets. On the other hand, when Ranke was working at the University of Berlin, it was an authoritarian state. It was very limited. There was a, some kind of parliament, but it, it was fairly powerless. Um, but the authoritarian state did not dictate to people in the university what to write or how to do historiography. Ranke was criticized for being insufficiently enthusiastic about German nationalism when he, when he published The History of Prussia. Uh, but they didn't, you know, he was not persecuted. They, they, he was maybe not popular, but, but they left him alone. And it's interesting that the historical sciences, even historical sciences that questioned and doubted and undermined part of the legitimacy of the state itself, survived and were created and flourished in authoritarian but liberal environment. The high criticism of uh, the New and Old Testament that undermined the Christian foundation of society. And yet, in authoritarian societies in what would become Germany, this is before Germany, are independent principalities, indeed more the Protestant than the Catholic ones, uh, people were allowed to say human beings wrote the Old Testament and the New Testament, and this is where it came from, and they were polytheistic and their na different names of God because they emerged from different polytheistic branches that were then synthesized later and so on and so forth. And that was all done in authoritarian but liberal societies, not democracies. Uh, and then only from there it spread to democr more democratic societies, to the United States, to, to um, uh, Great Britain, the origin was, was and, and the same thing, uh, you have to, th there's, people forget today that there was this branch of regimes that were liberal but authoritarian. Austro-Hungary is another example, very weak parliament with no authority, and that's why it encouraged extremism, and, and because people were not responsible for what they did, yet largely liberal, and it allowed people like Freud, uh, who were again writing outrageous things, uh, to survive in a way that perhaps in a democracy they couldn't, because the mob would get angry that there's somebody, uh, and then the politicians would try to satisfy the mob. The synthesis that you can, that liberalism can limit democracy, so you don't have mob, mob rule. And democracy gives accountability, creates accountability of the elected to the people who elect them within a liberal framework. That's only after the Second World War. Historically, these were entirely separate um, regimes. Why is that important today? Because now there were, there's been this attempt to reverse this historical synthesis and revert to something much more Athenian. Mm -hmm. We have democracy without liberalism. That's what Trump and Orban and all these illiberal uh, uh, democra democratic leaders were trying to do. Mm -hmm. Just let small, even uh, large minorities or small majorities would decide and oppress the minority without independent rights, without independent institution, and that creates all this kind of um, uh, noise that liberal democracies create, because it's always in, in clash between mm -hmm. the liberal institutions and the democratically elected illiberal leaders. What they are trying to do, because they are populistic, they, they, it's all about the passions, is to divert attention and confuse uh, people from what's going on. So, for example, Orban uh, uh, drew a uh, um, 
a parallel between his regime and illiberal democracy and the exact opposite authoritarian liberalism in Singapore, because Singapore is a wealthy country and, and he wanted to. Actually, it's, it's the opposite. These are opposite regimes. Uh, and in order to understand what's happening today with the rise of populism, we have to understand that democracy and liberalism do not always go together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they can contradict each other. My historical sympathy is with liberalism, but that doesn't matter for the analysis. Okay, yeah. And of course, this sort of democracy is op open to demagogues like yes. Trump or, or, well, historically, or all, those, all those populists that yep. come up nowadays. Right. Great. I think event, in the end, I want to talk to you about the future of the philosophy of history. So um, wh where do you think the field is heading and where would you want it to go? Well, I think the field, the existence of the question is safe because of the human condition. We are historical creatures. We ask where we are coming from, where we are going to. Uh, the idea that people stopped asking questions uh, is ridiculous. Of course, people do and they always will. The questions will, will always be there. Um, and what I proved, I think, in one of my articles is I just did it even quantitatively. I just looked at the databases, just the topics uh, uh, of articles in philosophy of historiography that are being published. It, it's, it's growing exponentially. The quality is, is a different matter um, uh, because there are a lot of dolphins who think they can do hydrodynamics. What, where, where are we today? And what, what is the source of the problem? And what creates this illusion, and I do argue it's an illusion, that the field is weak or disappearing or dying. It's an illusion. Why is it an illusion? What, when people talk about that, when they say the field is disappearing, they are making a sociological rather than philosophical generalization. I repeat, sociological rather than philosophical. The world we are living in, the imperfect world we are living in, is such that the dominance of the American market in academia is so overwhelming that whatever happens in America, because most jobs are in America, influences whatever happens anywhere else. The structure of American academia is something between, it's a pyramid structure uh, that resembles um, the champagne, uh, champagne glasses, you know, the, this pyramid of <laughs> uh, champagne glasses. So whatever happens in, it's, a, it's an oligopoly or an oligarchy. A few universities control the academic market. So whatever happens in those universities, and it's totally contingent, it's, 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 it's almost random determines who gets jobs and in what fields and so on and so forth. Now, if we go 50 years ago, uh, within those universities, there was Maurice Mandelbaum uh, at Johns Hopkins University, an excellent philosopher of historiography. I still use his work. I, I don't think it, much of it hasn't become obsolete or, or updated. Uh, he was working at Johns Hopkins, and at one time he was the president of the American Philosophical Association, meaning the most prestigious position in the, in, in the profession. And at Columbia, there was Arthur Danto, uh, who um, published Analytic Philosophy of History, and he had students who got jobs and so on and so forth. What happened? Well, with Arthur Danto, Andy Warhol happened. Uh, he had an interest in aesthetics. He, got a, uh, he, was, he started writing um, art criticism for the popular market. He was hanging out with Andy Warhol in New York, the art scene. Obviously, I mean, I can't blame him. If it, you know, my colleagues, Andy Warhol. Uh, you know, uh, I'll go for Andy Warhol, too. So he lost interest. Um, and he went on writing philosophy, but he, he wrote history of philosophy, sort of anachronistic interpretation of classical philosophy that's still written very clearly and very interesting. Uh, and, of course, art criticism. Morris Mandelbaum went on working until the 80s, but then he just retired and he was not replaced by another philosopher of history. And that's entirely contingent. And since then, in those universities, and I'm talking about half a dozen universities or 10 universities at the most, there has not been a philosopher of the historical sciences, a philosopher of historiography. Consequently, they did not have students who get jobs, and the philosophers of historiography who do appear, they come from somewhere else, and then they either don't get a job, and then they are bounced off the academic uh, market, or they get marginal jobs, and they don't give them enough time to write, and so on. So um, that's a sociological picture. Philosophically, that means nothing, because it's entirely contingent. All that, something entirely random, like some 
Ivy League University hire somebody because they do epistemology, philosophy of science, or whatever, you know. Um, uh, and then, unbeknownst to them, this person also would write philosophy of, of history and they would have, uh, or in historiography, and they would have students and so on. Or somebody is hired because they're doing that and they developed some interest in philosophy of historiography and they're tenured already and they have 30 years to, prov to produce students. Something as random in that can totally change the, the whole sociological scene. So, so the, because we're talking about such a small number, I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking altogether about maybe 100 jobs. Of, of people who are in a position to get their graduate student jobs in the American market mm -hmm. because of the class structure, not because of their philosophical genius, even though some of them are very good. Um, uh, and something as random and that can change the whole picture immediately. Just look about uh, other fields. Like aesthetics has exactly the same problem. They don't have anybody in, in those many universities, so it, it disappeared. But look at fields like uh, the epistemology of testimony. Uh, look at philosophy of biology. They used to be marginal fields, but something happened and somebody appeared and, and the whole thing changes. The same sort of entirely random, philosophically random development can happen with philosophy of historiography. Having said that, I think there's a number of people who work today on philosophy of historical sciences and historiography and are doing excellent work uh, uh, and they're very productive. People like Elliot Sober, uh, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, we mentioned Carol Cleland and Derek Turner. We can add Adrian Curry uh, at the University of Exeter. Uh, Adrian Curry's uh, teacher, Kim Sternley at Australian National University. Many people would consider him philosopher of biology, but I would consider him a philosopher of, uh, of the historical sciences. Uh, somebody like Peter Corso, he, he recently retired, but, but he's still productive. Um, that, and, and most importantly, uh, <laughs> new center in Ostrava for yes. employees, Center for Philosophy of Historiography. Why did that happen? Random, random development. I happen to be at the right place at the right time with the right grants with enlightened, can you believe that? Enlightened, bright academic administrators, open-minded, creative. They see somebody does good work. Okay, they throw money at them and say, create a center. And here I am. So here I am going to reverse the tide. I'm going to create great philosophy of historiography, yes. highly productive, lots of publication, revolutionize everything, and come from the margins. Not come from the Ivy Leagues, no. Um, but uh, come from the margins, which is basically what Annal did in France. I mean, they came, they, they did not come from the Ecole des Attitudes, where they are now. Mm -hmm. They came from Strasbourg, from the margins. Mm -hmm. from, from somewhere that was literally on the border with Germany. Uh, uh, so you start in the margin, you, you create a cohesive group, a, a school, uh, or in Czech, Ostrava Škola, which is what we're going to create. <laughs> and then you create something that, that has a brand name and you change the profession. And we will work together with the other great center in Ulu. Yes, I just wanted to add there's also the Ulu center that... And we will compete against each is, other and the result will be progress. As much from the periphery and trying to do the same thing. But final question, um, yeah. what are you currently working on? Well, there's a great book of origins. Uh, okay. book, uh, uh, so it's a general theory of origins. What are origins in general? Uh, how they relate to the inference of common cause? How the inference of common cause is reducible to that. Then I look at uh, uh, inference of origins in ordinary epistemology, in epistemology of testimony, epistemology of memory, challenging the uh, positivist conviction that memories and testimonies can only transmit knowledge, transfer knowledge rather than generate it, so it can be generated. And then in the various sciences, philology, geology, cosmology, Darwinian biology, and so on. So that's one project and then uh, the collection, the, the handbook for the philosophy of the historical sciences that I'm co-editing with David Chernin in Ostrava and that will be published by Bloomsbury uh, next year. And uh, then onward and, 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 and forward, as uh, you know, Salvador Dali said, uh, when I was five, I wanted to be Napoleon. That's, I can relate to that. Uh, when I was six, I wanted to be a cook. And since then, my exploration grew wider and wider. Okay, well, great. And we all got something to look forward to. Thank you, Avi, for the interview. Uh, thank you all in the future and whenever for watching it. And we'll see you next time. Thank you all.